Hey y'all, welcome back to part two of our conversation with Camila De Perla on the Do The Change podcast. We're going to hop right back into this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and Spotify page. So I'm going to do a hard topic shift, kind of, but also dive deeper into some topics like just more about leadership skills and advice for students looking to join um, the field of public health or medicine or just wanting just to seek just general information about experiences or general information about how to go about getting experiences in their field of interest. Because you've done a lot of um, work in regards to, or a lot of work that's ended up tailoring towards kind of where you're at now. And mm -hmm. so the first question um, is how important, how important is it for um, individuals from underrepresented and historically marginalized communities um, to see leaders who look like them in the field? And um, if you've had any experience kind of seeing folks who look like you in the field to represent your community, how has that made you feel as you yourself are kind of growing in your own leadership and like accomplishments? I mean, it's it's highly important, right? And yeah. that's one of the issues we have um, now and that there's not enough representation in medicine. Yeah. You know, for the communities that are being served. The United States is so diverse and yet you know, only I think five percent of physicians are Latinas, of practicing mm -hmm. Latinas, um, and I think it's about ten percent for Black doctors. And yeah, you know, being underrepresented in medicine, it's challenging because it's challenging in different in all stages of it. Being a pre med, and and especially you know, majority of these students are also first generation, so navigating college on yeah. top. Of getting pre-med and it's 1000 requirements yeah <laughs> that not only you know require your time but also money right. um so it really feels a lot of time it really feels like everything has been built to work against you yeah uh, and so I think that's where it's it's really important to not only have people that understand those experiences and have you know successfully gotten through it but also have that mentorship um, yeah you know those that have gone through and those that are starting because it's really difficult for other people to understand you know what your challenges are if they haven't gone through them and and people can help in any way they can right I've had a lot of yeah. people you know aren't Latino or aren't you know anything related to my identity that have helped or tried to help um but it's completely different when someone that understands like your realities is able to give their perspective and motivate you as well yeah. Um, and one of the uh, programs that has helped me a lot, actually, I did during my first year at Berkeley while I was applying to medical schools, mm -hmm. um, called Me Mentor. And mm -hmm. it's a great um, program for, uh, you know, pre-med Latino students. Um, and I was able to join their, um, their student readiness program. Okay. Uh, or medical, I think it's medical student readiness program, something like that. And it was a, about a year long um, where they had guest speakers talking about every aspect of the application process as you were applying to medical school and also doing workshops and all that kind yeah. of thing, fighting, you know, various different physicians um, and also medical students. But they also do a lot of other programming if you're interested in like PA or dentistry or other things. And I think programs like that are really important because um, you get, you know, firsthand knowledge and wisdom from people. Yeah, literally. And your background and and also have a lot of the same goals um, and motivations and passions for why they're doing what they do. Yeah. And like just sometimes seeing one person or meeting one person who's on the same path as you is sometimes like just all you need or sometimes you need to find that one. And like you said, there's like programs um, that you can just sign up for and like get connected with somebody or maybe you'll run into somebody in your class or someone who you don't think is doing it and then they are and then like that could be someone as well um, I know particularly particularly for um, the field of OEHS um, Berkeley offers this like diversity um, like program where actually it's called STEER and you can um, apply and basically get connected with a faculty mentor and you kind of can just get direct connection with folks there and build mentorship that way but also just um just honestly googling google is your best friend just be like oh 
blah, 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 like whatever field you're interested in, like public health mentorship. And then if you really want to go crazy, like put like for black students or for like Latina students or for um, like Asian American students. And they have those specific things. And it's just like a simple Google search. So it's really like, it's, it's there, but it's also like, sometimes you need someone to just tell you like yeah. Google promise you it's there. Yeah. Or chat, I don't know, chat GBT, like chat GBT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's hard. I don't know I think I like yeah. I stumbled across me mentor on some Instagram page or something and I was see like, there you go <laughs> I know about this because it's so, so, so right cool. the one time where like your phone was singing on you paid off where it's right like, right was... <laughs> um so I think also yeah. other other leaders or like other supporters that may not be in your field are also really helpful because you want yeah. you know maybe they for example my best some of my best mentors at LMU had nothing to do with health or public health or medicine I mean one of them is a theologian who you know love yeah, that it's very you know different yeah from what I was pursuing but is you know her name is Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andrew Yu, and she is my biggest supporter and opened a lot of doors, but was also okay. really willing to connect me to past students that may have been pre-med or, um, you know, help other students that maybe are also thinking about pre-med that are younger. Um, yeah. So definitely seeking, you know, being open to seeking support from other people as well. It doesn't have to be, because you never know Yeah. You know, what they can help you with or um, what kind of doors they can open as well. Yeah. And I guess like a follow-up would be like, for, for someone who's looking to start building those connections, how would you recommend going about it? Because I know there's like more traditional like ways of, you know, like networking events, stuff like that. But I know like for me and probably for you too, from what I know about you, it's like that can sometimes feel like, I don't want to say fake, but it can some, like, sometimes feel like you're you're operating outside of what's comfortable for you and maybe you just build it more organically or whatever. So like what ways would you, Kind of recommend to go about doing that or like how did you do it with like a mentor or two yeah I think I mean talking to them <laughs> right like like they're people <laughs> Hello. I'm like especially professors they have office yeah. hours right and yeah hours doesn't have to be just for academic related things it doesn't just have to be about the class you're taking you don't even have to be taking their class to go to their office hours and yeah, if you that's true <laughs> Right. And so if yeah. you heard from other students, oh, this professor is really cool. They're really supportive. They're really nice. You know, yeah. Want out to get you, go talk to them because odds are you probably have something in common or, you know, maybe, you know, they have a project that you could work on, even though it may not be exactly, you know, what you thought about, but the, yeah. being, those sort of opportunities and talking to people and building yeah. those relationships. Um, because I think it's just better to have good, more quality people in your circle. <laughs> yeah. And, and worst case scenario, like you have nothing in common and it was just kind of an informal in, like interview yeah. sort of thing to see what they're doing. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I don't think it hurts um, to talk to people, especially people that are already in positions of power. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's some wisdom they can provide <laughs> and just being honest like I've exactly. I've done the office hours at Cal where I'm like look this is what you're like I looked you up read your bio blah blah, blah and like this like this is what I've read and I don't really know how to go about this and this is like why I'm here this is who I am this is what I'm trying to do help like just be honest right I just need help and maybe they're not the point person but if you're very honest and clear about what you're trying to get out of that conversation you, who, who knows they may stick with you or they may be like oh actually this is the person for you and that that was their role in your entire like experience and that's fine yeah um, they, might, yeah. they might disappoint you too <laughs> and I've been disappointed a couple times but you know when the when the bios online seem much better than when you meet in person like and, this person seems so great and you're like whoa and and that's okay too because yeah you tried and you learned from it yeah. And, and still you might get those like other connections of people that might you know fit right a little more all righty so 
this is the yeah I'm just, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump into it so being a person of color sometimes talking about compensation in any form can sometimes be um, uncomfortable or like taboo but I also think it's important to discuss within our communities to kind of work on making those conversations more comfortable um just being honest and also too it, it's um just talking about in certain roles and things of that nature that you do deserve to be compensated for your time but then there's also roles where you may be like interning for free but you're also getting some really valuable experience that may lead to a higher pay position later so it's kind of like a weird kind of middle ground sometimes and so um yeah and so you kind of touched on it some of your internship or you did a lot of internship work. Um, and also I will do resume stuff, a lot of volunteer work. And yeah, so I'm just interested in apprentice, apprenticeship Woo. Um, are common, especially in the field of OEHS, medicine, EHS, really any STEM field. Um, it's common to kind of accumulate those before going into full-time roles or um, at like some um, graduate level kind of schooling. And so, um, I guess my question to you is how can recent graduates or high school students really assess the value of these opportunities um, or internship opportunities and determine if they will align with their long-term career goals? So how did you yourself kind of shake out which ones were worth your time of like, this is worth me doing it for free versus one that was like, it's kind of a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I think the way I went about it was based on what kind of experience I would get from it. Yeah. And, and also not being afraid of like doing one thing for one year and then yeah. stop. <laughs> if, if because you can only work for free for so long. Right. 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 <laughs> and it's 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 like it's you're in a very privileged position if you're able to do all this volunteering and free labor and internships for a long time because um, on the one hand you get a lot of experiences but on the other hand you know especially like low income or first gen or you know students uh, of <laughs> diverse racial yeah that's like you're you need money in order to go to school and be able to go to these internships too right yeah um I think seeing the way I saw it was trying to get different experiences and trying them out for for example I did um throughout my time at LMU I had about two jobs on average all four years um even yeah. though I did have a full ride to undergrad I still worked because yeah. I did extra money <laughs> um yeah. for driving for food for I think know. people hear full ride and think oh <laughs> you're set it's like no full there ride are. means those expenses I don't need to care about but like I need to live as a student and obviously a student you want to go out have fun and also eat and live so it's like yeah yeah and just other expenses that come up whether it be my own or like family expenses too right yeah so you know, I pursued an internship at a local community clinic that was for about a year and that was unpaid. And I got the most amazing experience there and have been able to build relationships with nurses and nurse practitioners that I still continue to this day, like six years later, we still talk. Um, and but I did that for a year because you know I I couldn't continue that being unpaid and then I saw it um in seeing you know I need I've done the internship work you know I've done the scruff work of like okay I'm sorting papers or I'm setting up a a patient room and things like that now I want to kind of go up on right. the last of my responsibilities um and scope of practice so I looked into becoming an EMT and mm -hmm. I did a summer EMT course um, so that one, I could get paid, but two, I could also get a different perspective on the healthcare field. Um, and I worked as an EMT for nine months during my uh, senior year of college. And it was great because I got a lot of different, you know, 
got to meet yeah. a lot of different kinds of people all over Los Angeles County um, and got to do a lot of cool things that I wouldn't have been able to do as an intern. Yeah. But at the same time, and I was getting paid, but EMTs get paid minimum wage, um, even though yeah. you're still lives. So yeah. that was not also, I mean, you know, I was a college student, so it's not like I was living off of that paycheck. Um, right. But at the same time, you know, it wouldn't have been sustainable post-grad. Um, so, and COVID uh, cut my time short anyways. Yeah, <laughs> um, on campus. I had to move yeah. back uh, <laughs> home and yeah. being in LA. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, really seeing like what kind of experiences and skills would you get out of the position, yeah. um, the work you're doing and you can even get insight from talking to people that have been there before. So for example, for the internship I talked about earlier, I didn't just jump into the internship because it was a clinic. I yeah. talked to a student that had been interning there who also went to LMU and asked them like, what is the environment like? Do you feel like you're getting something out of this? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of stuff. And they told me honestly, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go for it because it sounds great. Same with EMT you know, finding people that have worked before or when you're at your interviews, asking them, what is the environment in this workplace? Do people yeah. feel they actually get something out of working here? Especially, you know, there's a lot of pre-meds that are EMTs, not just people that do it as a full-time job. So right. um, definitely, you know, getting your, getting the information you need to make um, the right decision. Yeah. And I think that's really good advice. Just ask, just being, if you know what your goals are, just asking them when you're applying, like, hey, these are the goals I kind of want out of this. Or just being like, sometimes you just be upfront, like community plans are like, hey, I'm aspiring doctor, blah, blah, blah. I want to do X, Y, Z. This is what I want to get exposed to. Am I applying to the right position for this? Or should I be applying to a different position? Because sometimes you just apply to the wrong one and they have multiple like spots open. Um, but I think I appreciate what you said where you were saying that like, it's okay to leave after a year if it's not sustainable for you and like, what you just need realistically to live life, um, particularly as a student of color, that's challenging where you're like, you're like, okay, like this is helpful, but also it's actually making this other part of my life, like not as, just making it worse than what it needs to be and like being okay with um, leaving. And it's, it's fine to do that. Um, yeah, so sadly we are coming to the end of this awesome conversation. So I just wanna thank you for being here open honest with me and the folks listening and you just always have just great things to share which is why i'm super excited to have you here and so i just want to end with like one question about self-care like how do you manage um just yourself and your spirit as you're doing this health disparities work because that is emotionally taxing mm -hmm. very emotionally taxing um and also any closing thoughts or advice you have for folks who are thinking about doing change within the, in within their field or in the field of just anything really. And so the question I have for you is what are some daily or weekly self-care routines or habits that you have incorporated into your life and how have they overall kind of impacted your well-being and your ability to continue to lead and do the work that you are currently doing now? Mm -hmm. Um I think two things one is talking to people <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, whether it's your friends or your community really anyone right in your circle yeah um, I think talking about things is the best way to get through a situation because especially if those um people understand or are like somewhat in the route so for example like if there's something stressful about a class or something a student said like I would talk to Tyra because yeah. she would <laughs> speed dial. <laughs> and you know, being able to go through like, like, did you think this was okay too? Or what's your perspective on this? Or like just kind of getting through and just airing it out essentially, I feel like is the best thing to do. Yeah. Um doesn't mean like dumping all your stuff like on random people, yeah. but having those key people that you know like you can talk to about certain things because it's better to you know, get it out of your system, then just keep it bottled up inside and yeah, wait for like next week. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and then the second thing I do is I try to go to the gym um, consistently. 
Um, and I think that really helps like, you know, so the talking with friends is the emotional thing, but then the other is the getting it out physically. Yeah. <laughs> so whether that's through like running or weightlifting or something, yeah. um, sort of like reset my body. Um, and yeah. Have it ready for the next day and also have it ready for a long life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, tackling both. I think that's how I, I tackle both like mind and body. <laughs> yeah, like one is very like personal, like in regards to like regulating your inner self. And then the other part is like you're still practicing like social stuff as well, which is cool. Um, so any last thoughts you would like to share to the listeners or just in general, like life advice um I think my general life advice would be don't be afraid to take risks whether that means like talking to a professor you think might be intimidating or going out for a job position or internship or even just scheduling an informational interview with someone that you think is interesting but have never met in your life (laughs) so yeah or applying to uh, number one public university for a public health program <laughs> yeah no yeah about like don't be afraid to take those risks because you never know um what could happen yeah I want to echo that because that is so real where and also just like don't be afraid to fail in front of others I think that being comfortable failing is one thing but then being comfortable failing in front of others because you're going to learn the most like staying comfortable in your own space is great in some instances where it's an unsafe environment, but in other moments, stepping outside of that is where you grow the most. And particularly when you're the one asking the questions that no one wants to ask, or you're the one who's making sure that, you know what? I didn't understand what the professor said. Everybody's nodding their heads, but I don't understand. So I'm gonna raise my hand and ask. That is you, that's taking a risk too, because you're having to disrupt that space, you know? So yeah, that's awesome advice, just taking risks and in ways that are comfortable for you obviously like don't go crazy and like <laughs> do crazy stuff but do take risks yeah um so yeah I want to thank you for coming on the podcast maybe we'll like do a wrap around when you're in like year two or finishing your MS degree um but yeah just thank you for coming on the show you're you're awesome rock star as I already know a little biased but yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. just thank you all righty well I will see you soon um later (laughs) but uh yeah great thank you guys for listening um to the do the change podcast and we'll be having some more awesome speakers later on and yeah see y'all soon